Amen. Amen. Let's give our hands together for Pastor Dean. Um, Dean's going to come and speak to us this morning um, as we lead into Easter. Thank you very much, Dean. Bless you. Praise God. Well, good morning. It's a privilege to be able to um, bring something to you this morning. And um, let me just start by saying about four or five weeks ago, I can't remember how many it was, there was a lady um, in the church. She came forward at the end of the service, and uh, Joy and I both had the privilege of praying with her. Um, and if she's in here this morning, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, you'll know who you are, but I'm not going to use names. Um, but I want to share this because I want to uh, encourage you that God is on the move. And he is in the business of transforming lives. That's what he's about. That's why we gather together. I hope you don't come here this morning to meet with anybody else primarily than him. Because he wants to meet with you. And I hope that you want to meet with him. <clears throat> So this lady came forward, we both prayed for her, and uh, in that following week, um, she came to our house, and Joy spent some time with her, praying with her again, and we thought nothing more of it um, for about four weeks. And then we were sitting there one evening in our house, the doorbell rang, and there was this lady, and she had some flowers and some chocolates or whatever, and uh, a card just to say thank you for the prayers that we had offered up. God had answered them, and he'd not just answered them, he had answered them way beyond what our expectations were. <coughs> now, I know that this morning is Palm Sunday, but I've been asked to bring something on the theme of worship. And when I hear things like that, that makes me want to worship. Because God wants to change lives. And let me start by saying that I cannot possibly deal with the subject of worship comprehensively this morning. So I'm just going to bring a few thoughts that may or may not be helpful. I hope they encourage and I hope they challenge as well. Um, because we need to be challenged in this area. We need to be in a position where we constantly, we constantly want to push forward and not get stuck. So let me start by saying that um, worship is one of those words that is used rather loosely in the church today. And in many parts of the church it has simply come to mean singing. All right? And let me start by saying that worship is not singing. So I'm going to bring a few thoughts from the Bible that says what worship actually is. Now, having said that, singing is a wonderful expression of worship. So, but it's important to understand it's not worship. All right? So let's start from that point, and hopefully that's provoked you already. <clears throat> There's a few words in the Old and New Testament that are translated as worship, quite a number. There's about six in the New Testament. Um, but there's two key ones. Uh, one is shakar, which is the Hebrew, and the other is proskuneo, which is the Greek. And those two words essentially mean the same thing. They mean to bow down before somebody who is superior in reverence and honor for who they are. So you might, for example, do that to royalty, and you definitely do that to God. And it, it really does describe something of the physical nature of it, in that you get on your knees, your head is on the floor. It could mean to fall down, to be fully prostrate before God, to understand who he is and show him the respect that he deserves. So worship, in a sense, means to bow down. Now, when it comes to God, we could do that physically. We could get on our knees. We could fall prostrate on the floor. Some people do that. But you know what? It goes deeper than that, and it comes, it comes down to a posture of the heart. And so if you want to talk about worship, you have to start with the heart. And whether or not you've realized it, we've been singing that this morning, and in some of the song lyrics that were up there, it was all about the heart and the posture of the heart. Jesus highlighted the importance of the heart in worship when he said the following to some Pharisees, and he wasn't being complimentary, by the way. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 to 9, he said this to some Pharisees. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And he was quoting Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. But he makes it clear that outward expressions of worship, outward expressions are only acceptable to God if our hearts are first right towards him. Okay, you get that. <clears throat> So we must always come to him in humility, with thankfulness, recognizing our utter dependence on him for salvation. And so what that means is that when we're coming before him, things like pride and self-sufficiency, they've got to be laid down. They have to be laid down. We've got to come to him in humility, recognizing 
who we are in him. We need to come to him in weakness, not strength. Paul himself said, when I am weak, in other words, when I'm not relying on my own strength, my own abilities, when I'm weak, then I'm strong because God takes over. <clears throat> so let's uh, look at a few words of Jesus. Um, we come to worship Jesus, don't we? Yes. yes. We come to, so it's, it's good to understand what Jesus is looking for in a worship, isn't it? In a worshiper. So um, let's take the classic verse, John chapter 4, verse, well, 23 to 24. And uh, Jesus here describes what a true worshiper looks like. And so this is what I'm going to focus on this morning. And he said this, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. <clears throat> so we're going to focus on those words of Jesus where he talked about true worshippers worship in spirit or in the spirit and in truth. <clears throat> and we must pay careful attention to this. They are the words of Jesus and he emphasizes twice here how true worshippers worship the Father in the spirit and in truth truth. I never learned this early on as a boy. I was very disrespectful at school. I wasn't a Christian. So uh, in the school assemblies, when they start to sing, sing hymns, which I hated, I used to change the words. So I wasn't really uh, singing in, in truth. Uh, now, of course, I've changed, and I might change the words occasionally, but they're done in a respectful way. <clears throat> and some of you do that as well, don't you? Right, so I'm going to deal with these in reverse order. And start by thinking about what it means to worship in truth. And it might seem that I'm diverting off the main theme. And if you think that, you've missed the point. All right? You've missed the point. So this is really important, what Jesus said. Um, and let's start with John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said these words. We all know them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Jesus also prayed in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. And so God's word is also the truth. And those two statements are shown to be one and the same thing in John chapter 1, 14, which says that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So Jesus is the embodiment of the word, or put simply, he's the Bible in human form. If you want to know what the truth is, Look at Jesus. <clears throat> and then in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. If you hold to the truth, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in other words, if we hold to the teaching of the Bible, then we shall truly know Jesus. That's the only way to know him. If you stick to the truth. If you divert from the truth, you no longer know Jesus. That's not who he is. So we know the truth, and this is the promise. The truth will set you free. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And then we will truly become his disciples, and true worship can only come from true disciples. So our worship is only acceptable to God when we hold to the truth so that we worship in truth. And just to, sh to demonstrate this to you, the the seriousness of it. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. This incident where Jesus was approached by some Pharisees. And, uh, and they were annoyed at Jesus. Because what they, they said is that Jesus' disciples were breaking the tradition of the elders. Heaven forbid. And by that they meant the oral law. Which today in written form is the Talmud. And if you don't know what it is, it was basically it was a legal commentary on the Torah, the Mosaic Law, the first five books of the Bible, it was a legal commentary explaining how the commandments were to be carried out in daily life. And it held effectively the same weight as Scripture itself to the Jews. <coughs> and so they were accusing Jesus' disciples of breaking this tradition, this description of how the Mosaic Law should be worked out. And Jesus gave this incredibly stinging reply. He said, and why do you break the command of God. So he was accused of breaking the tradition of the elders, men, and he comes back and said, why do you break the command of God <clears throat> for the sake of your tradition? 
You say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their mother or father is devoted to God, they're not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So Jesus pointed out that their tradition actually nullified the word of God. He said the result was this, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship me in vain, their teachings are merely human rules. <clears throat> so I said that fast, do you get that? Do you see that by nullifying the word of God before men through their teaching, they nullified their worship before God. <clears throat> worship is in vain if teaching is false. Do you know the devil knows this very, very well? And right through the history of the church, he is constantly devising schemes. He has constantly devised schemes to introduce falsehood to the church. He's a master at it. He's a master at misusing and misinterpreting scripture to lead people astray. So when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, the devil deliberately misapplied a couple of verses from Psalm 91 to try to get Jesus to throw him off the highest point of the temple. Do you remember that? And Jesus was not tempted for a moment and corrected Satan's falsehood um, by using the correct application of another scripture. So he, he brought falsehood back to truth. Do you get that? Do you know he uses the same tactics today? And unfortunately, if people do not know the truth, God's word, well enough to spot when he has twisted and distorted it so that it's no longer truth but a lie, they're led into error. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul saw many people saved through the gospel. He planted and established churches in many towns and cities. He then found himself continually having to defend the churches from false teaching. See what he wrote in Galatians chapter, chapter 1 and verses 6 to 10. <clears throat> he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are now turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse, as we've already said. So now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, those are really strong words from Paul. But they show to us that we should not entertain any attempt to pervert the gospel, even from angels. The last verse is particularly important and shows it is more important to please God than people. And going back to Matthew chapter 15, after Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, his disciples came to him and they asked this question. They said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? They're quite concerned they defended, he defended the Pharisees. Do you know they were offended? And he replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind follow the blind, both will fall into a pit. And in this day where people seem to get offended over any little thing, Jesus was not afraid to offend. Um, what he was concerned about mostly was speaking the truth, which is what sets people free, even if it offends. And so um, we also need to come to that place where we are not afraid to offend. Let me assure you that the gospel will offend. If you speak the truth, I guarantee you the gospel will offend. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, quite a few of you. The gospel offends, but it also saves. And it's that, that's what we're after, that the true gospel saves souls. And um, that's what God's after. That's what God's after. The gospel is concerned with where we spend eternity. And I want to say this as well, just to make it clear. You know, the invitation 
to come into God's kingdom is fully inclusive. It's open to everybody. Absolutely everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is, what you've done, who you are. It doesn't matter. It's absolutely fully inclusive. Access to the kingdom is another matter. It is extremely exclusive. It is excluded only to those who repent of their sin, who fully acknowledge it, and come before God asking for, rep- for forgiveness on the basis of the blood of Jesus, and then commit to follow him, renouncing sin and living for him. That's what it means. Access is exclusive. <clears throat> Do you know the reason why people often get offended by the gospel is because there's a cost to following Jesus. And sadly, many people want the benefits of salvation without the cost. They want to come to God on their terms and not on God's terms. And none of us can do that. All of us must choose whether or not we accept God's word as truth and whether or not we are willing to turn from sin as God defines it. A distorted gospel is not going to save anyone. So that's why it's so important when Jesus said, the true worshippers I'm looking for worship God in spirit and in truth. We must always remain in truth. So then he also said we need to worship in the spirit. So let's look at that, shall we? A.W. Tozer was an American pastor and Christian author who lived from 1897 to 1963. And he once said this, he said, there are churches so completely out of the hands of God that if the Holy Spirit withdrew from them, they wouldn't find it out for many months. And God forbid that we should ever become a church like that. So we need to consider how to be worshippers who worship in the Spirit. And you know what, this requires great courage because it means that we mustn't control things too tightly. We've got to allow the flexibility for the Holy Spirit to move. Too much control is the fastest way to squeeze out the Holy Spirit. Let me give you another quote from A.W. Tozer. And remember, he's speaking decades ago. So this was valid in his day, and I believe it's valid in our day as well. And uh, so he observed the following. He said, "I, I wonder if there was ever a time when true spiritual worship was at a lower ebb. To great sections of the church, the art of worship has been lost entirely, and in its place has come that strange and foreign thing called the program. This word has been borrowed from the stage and applied with sad wisdom to the public service, which now passes for worship among us. And um, there's nothing wrong with having programs. We need some structure, but that structure mustn't um, squeeze out and remove the Holy Spirit from our gathering. So there needs to be flexibility with the program, right? You understand that? <clears throat> I'll try and explain it as I go along. Fifteen years ago, I think it was, Matt Redman felt the need to write a song called The Heart of Worship. You all know that song? Great song. And uh, I think it's been revived uh, quite a bit in our day, but um, The Heart of Worship. He wrote it when God was challenging him and speaking to him to get back to the heart of worship. In fact, it was a whole church thing. It was at Soul Survivor. Mike Pilavachi instigated it. And uh, um, in the, the recent COVID lockdown period, Jeremy Riddle felt the need to do a similar thing by writing a fantastic book called The Reset, which is all about getting back to spiritual worship. And uh, thanks to my lovely daughter, Lizzie, I've discovered a great podcast series uh, called Redman and Riddle on this whole theme. And it's uh, a great thing to listen to. I'm still working my way through it. Anyway, to get back to the heart of worship, that's a constant battle. But you know what? If we want to be true worshippers, then we need to pay attention to it. So let me just look at some of the things that the Bible says about worshipping in the Spirit. And uh, you understand here, I'm just going to remind you, I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm trying to bring some things out to encourage and hopefully challenge a bit. So... um, this is not the, whole, the full picture. But first of all, let me make some comments about uh, corporate worship or, um, uh, or singing in, when we're gathered together, singing in the assembly. I'm going to put it like that and you'll see why when I read this scripture. <clears throat> there is a single verse, one, 
a single verse in the entire New Testament that specifically mentions corporate singing. One verse. And that's Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12. And there it says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. Now, in writing this, the, the author of the book of Hebrews is actually quoting Psalm 22, verse 22. But nevertheless, that's the only verse that mentions singing God's praises when we are gathered together. Now, despite that fact, just think about the time, energy, and money that we expend in the church on this single activity. Think about that. And before you get the impression that I am against singing in our gatherings, I most certainly am not. I absolutely love it, you know, and I just want to see more of that. <clears throat> but I firmly believe that our singing is only really worship when it releases the Holy Spirit. When we come together and begin to express our worship through singing with the right heart attitude, as we've already discussed, it has the potential to release the Holy Spirit so that you can touch and transform lives. And that's why I began with that testimony. That's what God wants to do. Touch and transform. Now, I say it's got the potential to because that will only happen if we make room for the Holy Spirit to move. <clears throat> Let me read you three more verses from the New Testament about singing in a gathering. So I said there's only one. Um, there's three more. They don't specifically mention the assembly, but they do talk about singing to each other. So that constitutes a gathering, doesn't it? So three more verses, and the crucial difference with all of these verses is that they specifically mention singing in the Spirit, and that's what Jesus is looking for. So the first is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, and that says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that's the first verse. The second is like it, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13 and 1 Corinthians was actually written before the other two letters. So this one strictly should come first. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13, he says, For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Now, these verses are all written by Paul. And the verses in Ephesians and Colossians are very similar. They tell us what we should sing and speak to each other. In other words, in a gathering. This includes psalms. And the Greek word there is salmos. And it really means like a pious or a religious song. Something like those in the Old Testament. Um, the, the book of Psalms, for example. So, um, and it specifically means accompanied by a stringed instrument. You look at the translation for this word, salmos, it talks about twitching, twanging fingers. And, uh, I mean, who doesn't immediately think of Joe when you hear that? <coughs> twitching, twanging fingers. Anyway, so um, these are pious religious songs which are accompanied by stringed instruments. That's what salmos is. Um, hymns is not what you think. Uh, the Greek word is humnos. And it literally means a song of praise or thanksgiving to God. And then all three of these verses talk about singing in the Spirit. And Paul clearly explains this to be singing in tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. But there's a progression here. So let's just think about the progression that we see in these verses, showing that our singing should lead somewhere. <clears throat> so first, Ephesians 5 instructs us to both sing and to make music from our heart to the Lord. And we had a wonderful, beautiful time um, illustrating that this morning. Great time of worship we had. And, and we did that. We did that progression. You might not have realized you were doing it, but you did. And it's a just a progression from singing words that are external. We put the lyrics up for you to singing words that are internal. And they come straight from the heart. <laughs> and so Paul sort of suggests that kind of progression in this verse in Ephesians. 
So let's think about um, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and the progression that's shown there when they start talking about what we should sing. And the linkage between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, or psalms, hing, si, psalms, hymns, and songs in the spirit, however you want to interpret it, the link is not or, the link is and. So it's a progression. So if psalms is taken to mean the psalms of the Old Testament, this is literally singing scripture. It's literally singing the word of God. And sometimes we do that, don't we? Uh, and then um, we move on to hymns, which are songs of praise, which allow for the full creativity that God has placed within man to be used continually to write new and fresh expressions of praise to God through song. That's what hymns are. This is why God repeatedly says in the Psalms, sing to me a new song, because he is a creative God. And he's put something of that creative ability within us, and he wants it to continuously come out in fresh expressions of praise. It's to enable us just to fully express and release the love for God that we feel on the inside. And then lastly, we can sing in the spirit. Worship in song is supposed to lead to a release of the spirit. <clears throat> So, having seen that there are at most four verses in the New Testament that talk about singing when we're gathered together, and three of these talking about singing in the Spirit and give that progression, there are three whole chapters that talk about releasing the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we are gathered together. And these are 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14. That is why God is looking for worshippers who will worship in the Spirit. When we're gathered together, God wants to release the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that lives are transformed. We should expect the gifts of the Spirit. We should desire the gifts of the Spirit. We should make room for the gifts of the Spirit, and we should be ready to receive them and impart them. Do you know what? God has chosen not to dictate to us how we should structure our gatherings. He doesn't care. He's creative. But this one thing he's emphasized to release the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1 says this, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. I want you to ask yourself this morning, do you eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Some people eagerly desire that they never raise their head ever again, right? And because they're afraid of them. But God in his word says we should eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and especially prophecy. Do you know these are gifts from God? And if they're gifts from God, they're not only good, they are exceedingly good. The amazing thing that is if you receive one of these gifts, they're intended to edify other, others, except for tongues, which is supposed to edify yourself. They're intended to edify others so that you are blessed to be a blessing. How wonderful is that? Do you know, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 to 25 demonstrates the power of prophecy. <clears throat> Let me read it. This is amazing. It says, if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying. How many people are prophesying? Everyone. Everyone. All of us. If an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin. And are brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down. That sounds like worship. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now I want to ask you this question. Do you want to be a church where unbelievers walk in and their, their, their response is, surely God is among you? You want to be a church like that? How amazing is that? That is the effect of the gifts of the Spirit that God is telling us in his word. <clears throat> and so I just want to wrap up now and just allow some time for the Holy Spirit to do some business in here this morning. And I want to start just by asking the question, how is your heart this morning? How is it? You know, have you come in this morning and, uh, and there's a lot of stuff going on on the inside, which means on the outside, yeah, you're lifting your hands up, you're singing the words, perhaps you're not lifting your hands up, perhaps you're just, you're here and you're singing the words, or perhaps you're not even in that place and you're just here. But your heart's broken. 
in that place where you're saying to God, I don't know what the next step is. I don't know where you're taking me. And this morning, God wants to bring you back to that place where you can fall down. Not knowing where he's going to take you. Not knowing what he's going to do. Just trusting him and worship him. You know, when Job had everything taken away from him, this is real worship. When Job had everything taken away from him, his first response, his first response was to worship God. And you might think it's all easy sometimes for those who stand at the front. And I'm going to share something that is hard. But recently, Joy and I, we've seen somebody come to know Jesus. And we've been praying them for about 20 years or more. They come to Jesus. Now, that's enough to cause you to worship, isn't it? But the cost is high. The person I'm talking about, his wife has left him. She had an affair, she left him. He's got two teenage girls. Just, just at that point where they're transitioning from a child to an adult. And the mother's gone. God, that's hard. I wanted to see them come to know Jesus. But not at this cost. Not at this cost. But he knows best. And God sees your situation this morning. Do you know, hidden, hidden in this room this morning, there's a lot of frustration. And the devil can use that to bring division. He can use it to break the effectiveness of us as a body. To make us ineffective in reaching people for the kingdom. And if that's you this morning and you're struggling with frustration, perhaps things are not going how you think they should go. Perhaps somebody's disappointed you. The first step is first, you forgive that person. You come back to God in worship. Say, look, I'm your servant. It's not my church, it's your church. I'm just here to serve. And I want to invite you this morning. If you want a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit to bring you back to that place of sincere worship where you simply bow down in humility, can you just come forward? And we would love to pray for you this morning. We would love to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. You know, it's just come to my mind that here's a picture of worship for you. A sinful woman. Knew she was a sinful woman. The whole town told her so. And she knew herself. She came to Jesus. She wet his feet with her tears. She dried his feet with her hair and she kissed his feet in worship. A sinful woman and he forgave her. And perhaps this morning you're struggling with a sin you just can't shake off and God could break those chains. You too, you come forward and we want to pray for you. We're just going to move this. <laughs>